video. On the virtual Bible study tonight, we're going to talk about righteousness. We're going to talk about several aspects of righteousness and things that are taught and believed about righteousness. We're going to talk about righteousness, imputed righteousness, self-righteousness, and the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Oh boy, it's going to be a good discussion, and you want to be a part of it, and we're going to start right now. It's time for this week's edition of the Virtual Bible Study. The Virtual Bible Study is a live, internet-only call-in program dedicated to the honest study and discussion of God's Word. Do you have a question about something in the Bible? Or are you simply interested in learning more about the Scriptures? If so, we hope you'll stay tuned tonight as we look into the pages of God's Word. The Virtual Bible Study is brought to you this time each week by the College View Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. You can participate in the discussion tonight by calling 93 one three eight one four five six seven or by emailing your questions or comments from collegeview.com we hope you'll take out your bibles and study along with us as we begin an exciting study of god's word on this edition of the virtual bible study we welcome you into the virtual bible study uh, for thursday may 16th 2019 thank you for joining us on the program tonight my name is jacob Gwynn. my father greg Gwynn is here hello dad jacob great to be with you tonight with you kyle's here kyle welcome it's good to be here yeah get that microphone over there so you can talk to us tonight get your fingers ready to send in your comments at questions at collegeu.com or in the chat room or give us a call on the phone 877-381-4567 is a toll-free line to comment with us tonight we want to talk about, well uh, before we do that uh, we remind you to uh, send us a, a email a request to get on our update list if you're not and send us an email with your snail mail address and we'll send you a bumper sticker we're always willing to do that and help you spread the word about the virtual Bible study. If yeah. you're not doing that yeah. already, we'd love to get your help. We also want to uh, remind everyone that we're streaming our uh, services and Bible studies live on YouTube and also th therefore archives of all those worship services and Bible studies are on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is College View Live Stream. It's not the same channel that you're watching here on the virtual Bible study, but College View live stream, and we're getting we're getting some uh, traffic there, and uh, we hope people will use that resource. All right, check it out, and check out our podcast if you're not uh, signed in there. Go to sign up resources from our website, and you can find out how we can get, we'll just go ahead and push those sermons right to your podcast receiver, and also the virtual Bible study if you're not signed up. Do that if you've never been to our website. It's thevirtualbiblestudy.com. Check it out. And get in touch with us and let us know your thoughts, your comments, or maybe just tell us where you are and how you found out about us. All right, so we want to talk about righteousness tonight, Jacob. And in the questions that I sent out earlier to up our update list included these. Number one, what is the proper definition of righteousness? Number two, what is the doctrine of imputed righteousness? And is this doctrine true or, true or false? Why or why not? Number three, what is self-righteousness? Is it self-righteous to speak out against sin? Is it self-righteous to teach that there's a right way to serve God and only those who do so will please him and go to heaven? And number four, Jesus condemned the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, Matthew 5, verse 20. Describe their righteousness and what was wrong with it. Okay. All right, so um, let's just start out and probably take almost no time at all to define righteousness Righteousness, in the most simple definition, is the state of being right. Um, I think sometimes we try to make it more complicated than it is. It's a, it's a religious word. We seldom use it other than in religious discussion. And so sometimes there's a mystique or a, sort, of a, 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 a sort of an eerie sense about words that are almost exclusively used in religion. But in this case, this is really simple. The definition is in the word. It is righteousness. It's, it, it is the state of being right. Now, that term is used about God himself. God is righteous. God is perfectly right. Uh, it, it also has the de, uh, sort of synonyms that would blend in in that definition is just, uh, fair, uh, impartial, uh, all, you, th you think about God. God is just and right. Everything that he does by definition is just and right. He is righteous. It, one of his fundamental characteristics is that he is righteous. Uh, so, so the word is used that way. Well, 
if you think about it, if, if God is righteous, then I could never be righteous because I couldn't attain to the same level that God is. But actually, God has made it possible for us to be righteous, to be made right uh, through the salvation he has offered us through his son, Jesus Christ. So we can be right. We can be justified because God has made salvation possible to us. But to be righteous is simply to be in the state be in a state of being right. That's mm -hmm. all it is. All right. That's what Dwight in Iowa sent to us tonight. He said, I was looking for de definitions of righteousness to see what was out there, and I found this, the condition acceptable to God. Found this to be about as easy as it gets for people to understand, and he said he's looking forward to tonight's study. Thank I you think that's right. right. All right. And then Daniel in, uh, down in Jennings, Florida, said, sent in a message. He said, uh, the state of being fair, fairness righteousness or a uh, righteous uh, sorry the state of being fairness righteous or justified god is righteous in that he is morally just in character and action god cannot be charged with not being completely correct romans chapter 3 verse 4 okay so that's that's it that's the idea i mean it, it if you think about god then you, you think that's what he is. I mean, that by definition, that's what God is. All right. Kent in Calhoun, Georgia, who joined us on the program last week, he says the term righteousness, uh, dike di iosunu, I don't know. He gives the Greek it's word. It's all Greek to me. Yeah. Is defined uh, def depending upon the context in which way the term is used. It is used, one, as an attribute or characteristic of, of God as found in Romans 3, verse 5, verse uh, 25 as well. And 2 Corinthians 9, verse 9. In a moral or righteous sense of being upright as a reflection of doing right according to Matthew 5, verse 6, verse 10, and verse 20, Romans 6, verse 13. The condition of being made acceptable to God in Christ. This means that one is justified, cleansed by the blood of Christ as an alien sinner by obedience to the gospel or as a fallen child, uh, a covenant child of God being restored according to Romans chapter 1, verse 17, and James 5, 19, and 20. Thank you for that, Kent. Yeah. So to, to be righteous is, is simply to be in a right state, to be right and be in a right state with God. Um, and that's, that's really just a, 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 as simple as it gets. Okay. Uh, if, if I want to be righteous, I have to do what's right. I have to do what God defines as right. He that is righteous will do that which is right. And God defines what is right. So a really very simple definition, although sometimes I think we try to... to uh, sort of make it more difficult. Now, one of the things we want to talk about is how people have misused the concept of righteousness. And the first one that we want to talk about is the, the concept of imputed righteousness. And I ask the question, what is imputed righteousness? The word impute is sort of an accounting terminology. Yep. It is and some newer versions will be will use instead of the word imputed, it, they will use the term credited to one's account. And so instead of it being imputed to you, it's it's credited to you. It's the same meaning and it's the same sense. And and so when uh, when we think of imputed righteousness, what is meant by that in denominational circles is Jesus was perfectly righteous. And when we allow him to do so, then he imputes that righteousness to us. In other words, his personal righteousness is credited to our account. Calvinists teach this. Uh, and if you think about it, if that happens, I mean, then there's nothing left for me to do. If Jesus' perfect righteousness is credited to my account, then there's nothing left for me to do, and that's basically what Calvinists say, that, that we're saved simply by accepting the, the redemptive work of Jesus. And then you can't be lost. And therefore you can't be lost because your, credit, your, your ledger shows perfectness there. The perfect righteousness of Christ is imputed to you. And, and it's, it's, in other words, your, your ledger sheet isn't, isn't uh, available anymore. On, on the ledger sheet, is the life of Jesus and the, and the perfect righteousness which he lived. There's no place in the Bible that teaches that the personal righteousness of Jesus is imputed to us or credited to us. Again, that word impute may be somewhat confusing because that, again, is sort of a religious terminology. Uh, but it, just think about a 
credited to you. I think that makes it easier to understand. There's no place in the scripture that says the personal righteousness of Jesus is credited to us. Um, let me let me read a part of an article that I've had in my file for a long time. Some of our listeners will remember Morris Norman, who was a gospel preacher and pretty prolific writer. His his articles showed up a lot of times in in bulletins. Um, uh, notice, here's an example that he used: A man is convicted of a law violation. He must pay the fine or go to jail. He has not the ability to pay the fine. A friend who has the ability pays the fine for him. The friend is not a law violator. His innocence is not imputed or credited to the criminal. Only the payment is credited to the criminal. The criminal is no longer charged because the fine has been paid. I thought that was a pretty good way to picture what Jesus did for us. Um, so Again, it's, it's not that his personal righteousness is credited to us, but that he paid the fine that we, that we owed, that we couldn't pay ourselves. And, and so that's what happens. But righteousness is something. Like 1 John 2, verse 29, he that doeth righteousness is righteous. I mean, righteousness is what you do, not what is done for you. Uh, we can be accounted as righteous because of what Jesus has done. He paid the fine for us. And, and so we can be accounted as righteous, but not because his personal righteousness was put on our, on our account. Rather, his personal righteousness paid the fine that we owed and couldn't pay. Let's get Kent's uh, answer for tonight. He says, the doctrine of imputed righteousness is falsely affirmed by both Calvinist and Arminianism. This false doctrine attempts to argue that the personal righteousness of Christ is transferred to sinners. And they are saved by such taking place. Personal righteousness is not that which is transferred. One cannot take the righteousness of another being and give it to someone else. Denominational preachers and debaters misapply Romans 4, verses 3 through 6, and 22 verse, or, or, four, chapter 4, verses 22 through, through 24, and espouse this false view. While individuals are made righteous through the gospel and being forgiven of sins, the way they are made righteous is not by transferring the personal righteousness of Christ to another's account, one is made righteous by doing what God's plan of righteousness requires. Romans 6, verse 3, 6, 17 through 18, and 1 John 3, verse 7. I think Kent's right on there. And so, in other words, the, the outcome is that we are put, uh, that we are made right because Jesus paid the, 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 the penalty of our, of our sin. So we're made right, and we can be viewed as righteous, but not because his personal righteousness was transferred to us, but because he, as a, a perfect non-sinner, was able to pay the price that we owed. And so we, we don't owe the debt anymore because Jesus paid it, but it's not because of his personal righteousness that we are righteous. God imputed righteousness to Abraham, Daniel says, uh, in from Jennings, Florida, because of the, his un belief in God, and God will do the same for us if we believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead, Romans chapter 4, verse 24. If we understand what belief involves, we can also share in this accounting. Is this doctrine true or false? Why or why not? What? Oh, that was your question. What must be made clear is uh, that one is required to act in obedience to have a saving belief, James 2, 21 through 24, and practice righteousness, 1 John 3, verse 7. Yeah. I think the reason, I mean, this is kind of a technical theological yeah. question, but the reason why it's important is if the personal righteousness of Jesus is imputed to me, there's nothing for me to do. I'm now perfect because Jesus' righteousness is credited to, Jesus' perfection is credited to me. So I don't have to repent. I don't have to Stop using confess. the foul language I I don't use. have to be baptized because the personal righteousness of Jesus is on my ledger now. And, that's, and that, that is the problem with that doctrine. It's kind of a technical doctrine, but imputed righteousness is not taught in the Scriptures, and the, and the danger of it is that it leads to the conclusion that Calvinists and others have reached that there's nothing for you to do. But to be righteous, you must do righteousness. 1 John 3, verse 7 that Kent mentioned is, is another. John mentioned it twice. He mentioned it in chapter 2, verse 29, and also in chapter 3, verse 7, 1 John uh, so, uh, 
righteousness, you must do what is right to be righteous. And, and so, you've got to be obedient. Yeah, you've got to be obedient. And so, again, that's a kind of a technical question, uh, but it is a false doctrine. The idea of the imputed righteousness of Christ uh, is a false doctrine that we should be aware of. Uh, I doubt that very many people who are in, in Calvinist denominations probably have ever heard anything about that, but it, it underlies some of the doctrines and practices that they engage. All right. I think we should take a break and when we come back. Maybe we should lighten it up a little bit. I think we probably all have heard this, uh, this term, self-righteousness. Yeah. So now with some of the sort of the technical aspects out of the way, let's talk about self-righteousness and what constitutes self-righteousness. What constitutes self-righteousness? We don't want to be, or do we want to be self-righteous? Maybe, you, maybe we do want to be self-righteous. What's that all about? Uh, we're going to take that on the other side of the break. Hopefully get your thoughts. Don't go anywhere. We're back right after this. Did you hear what they just said? Call in during this break and let everyone know what you think. The virtual Bible study continues after this announcement. Do you remember when elders, deacons, preachers, and Bible class teachers and all church members had strong commitment to the Word? Do you recall when you can always count on book, chapter, and verse preaching from the pulpit? Can you think back to a time when Christians were known as people of the book because they knew their Bible so well? We're still trying to be a church like the church you read about in the Bible. And we're still doing the same things you remember from way back when. Are you longing for a return to the way things used to be? Come and visit. See for yourself. Here's some quotes worth pondering. You can't expect your children to listen to your advice and ignore your example. Honesty in little things is not a little thing. If you depend on others to make you happy, you'll be endlessly disappointed. If you want to do something positive for your children, try improving your marriage. Envy is the enemy of happiness. Either control your attitude or it will control you. Be content with what you have, but never with what you are. Plotting revenge only allows the people who hurt you to hurt you even longer. Position can be bought, but respect must be earned. Man, wish I'd said that. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. The virtual Bible study continues. We're back on the program tonight as we talk about righteousness and looked at the definition. We looked at the doctrine of imputed righteousness. Now on to something maybe a little bit lighter. More uh, practical. More practical. Maybe a little easier to understand. The idea of self-righteousness. What is it? Well, uh... First of all, I just wonder how many people who are listening to us tonight have ever been accused of being self-righteous. My guess is that probably a significant percentage have. Uh, when would that happen, maybe? Well, a lot of times that's sort of a favorite accusation made. Uh, if you were coming to me to correct me for something that, that I had obviously done wrong, you shouldn't and I'm not the cat. And you, I, should, you should be kicking the cat. And I'm not really willing to admit that I've done wrong or... Uh, oh, humbly confess my wrong. I, said, I might come back and say, "Well, you're just being self-righteous," you yeah. know. Uh, and so that—that's the way it's usually uh, that, it, how it comes out. Um, I'm not sure that the people who use the word that way even understand what they're saying. You know, I heard someone say once, "If you're going to insult me, please do it accurately." Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think sometimes that accusation of self-righteousness, they're, not, they're throwing out that, that charge. It, it's just a defense mechanism. Yeah. Uh, but self-righteousness, first of all, as we said, righteousness itself is right action based upon an established standard. And so... We need to understand righteousness, but self-righteousness. Uh, let's start out by saying what it's not, Jacob, what self-righteousness is not. Okay. It is not that I say that there's a right way and a wrong way, a good way, a, a proper way, and, and, and ways that are not right and proper. So if you tell uh, somebody that there's a right way to live, then that's not self-righteousness. Yeah. But I would be, I, I think there's probably a high probability. If I told somebody that, especially religiously, if I told them that's wrong, what you're doing is wrong, this is the way that you're supposed to do it, this is what the Bible teaches, they would say, well, you are self righteous to make that judgment. It's a very popular idea that, 
you know, you do your own thing. What's right for you may not be right for me, but it's right for you. So you, you do it your way. I'll do it my way. And everybody's of right and will agree to disagree. And, and um, I'm okay. You're okay. One church is as good as another, all that sort of stuff that gets thrown out there. Um, so when we say no, this is wrong and here's what's right, we're accused of being self-righteous. Yeah. Um, but the fact of the matter is the scriptures do talk about a singular and proper way to serve God. Way back in the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah said one way is better and the other ways are wrong. When he said, Jeremiah 6 verse 16, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where is the good way and walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Notice Jeremiah even back in Old Testament times, although they were under a different law of God than we are now, even back then, Jeremiah said, there is the good way. He didn't say, get in a, get in a good way. Find one. There's lots of them out there. Find, find the good way that suits you and get, get in a good way. No, he said, get in the good way. It's always been, that's how it's always been in regards to serving God. He has had a, speci a specified and understandable way in which he wants people to serve him. Uh, again, in Jeremiah 10, 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. So you got to remember that men are incapable of determining what's right, uh, uh, what's best, what, what they should be doing. They're, they're not capable of that. So we've got to trust in God. Uh, Jesus himself took this stand that there's a right way and a wrong way. Jesus was more emphatic about that probably than anybody else in all of the Bible. In Matthew seven thirteen, beginning, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be which find it, or few there be that find it. Jesus was the one who said most people are going to be lost. The majority is going to be lost, and only a minority will be saved. Okay. And then finally, remember the famous words of Jesus in John fourteen six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. That's pretty exclusive. If you think about it, that's really exclusive because that, that excludes Muslims, it excludes Jews, it excludes Hindus, uh, it excludes Buddhists. They're all excluded when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Uh, well, Jesus being pretty exclusive there. And if we actually, if we repeated the words of Jesus, there are folks in the religious world who would call us self-righteous. Right. Just because we're quoting what Jesus said. Right. But Jesus said there is a right way. And other ways are wrong, and so you, you are not being self-righteous simply when you uh, e express that. And that was one of the sub-questions we asked. Is it self-righteous to teach that there's a right way to serve God, and only those that do so will please him and go to heaven? That's not, self that's not being self-righteous when we teach that. Uh, uh, Jesus did that. We're imitating Jesus. Yeah, that's what Daniel in Jennings Florida said. He, he said, Jesus said unto them in Matthew, or John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Matthew 7, 13, enter in at this narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be who go in there. So Daniel quotes the two verses, or two of the verses you mentioned. And says, no, that's not self-righteousness if you say yeah, that. Yeah, and Kent did the same. He, he, everybody went to that same verse, John 14, verse 6. It is not self-righteous to teach that there is only one right way to serve God, and only those who do so will please him and go to heaven, John 14, verse 6. So <clears throat> uh, sometimes when we're trying to identify a, a situation or a position, it's good to talk about what it's not. And let me give you another thing that self-righteousness is not. You are not being self-righteous. Um, uh, again, when you teach that people have to live a certain way in order to go to heaven. Um, let me take you back to the Old Testament again. Deuteronomy 6.25. It will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all the commandments before the Lord our God, all this commandment before the Lord our God, just as he commanded us. Now, that's New American Standard Version. Um, 
Note, Moses said, it will be righteousness. We will be right. It will be righteousness for us. How? If we are careful to observe all this commandment before the Lord our God as he commanded us. It's always been that way with God. You're going to be right. You've got to do what he said. 1 John 3, verse 7, as we already quoted, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. There's something that you have to do, and you have to do it the way God said to do it. And so you're not being self-righteous when you say there's right and there's wrong, and you've got to do it this way, or else you will not please God. We're just teaching what the Bible teaches. Now, I think the, I think the problem some people want to jump to the conclusion, you say, oh, well, you think you're perfect then. You know, so I guess you're perfect. You're keeping all the commands. You're keeping them just exactly and perfectly. We're not saying that. All right. In other words, when we say this is, this is the truth and this is what God expects of people, this is the right way and other ways are wrong, it's, it's a leap to assume that we're saying, and we are perfect in doing it that way. We're not claiming that. We're not claiming perfection. But we are saying there's a perfect way that God has provided for us, and that's what we ought to seek to attain to. The other way, uh, the, 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 the inverse of that would be, are you claiming then there's not a right way and a wrong way? Or are you claiming that there is a right way, but it doesn't matter if you live that way or not. You can live any way you want, even though there is a right way. So I mean, you've got to look at the alternatives here. If you're saying, it's, it's so, oh, it's self-righteous if you say there's a right way and that's the way you've got to live, then you, if you say that's wrong, then you must be implying either, one, there isn't a right way or a wrong way, or two, there is a right way, and it doesn't matter if you live that way or not. Yeah, exactly right. All right. You th- so basically, be careful what, you, what you're arguing, because logically, you make that argument, you're, you're, you're going someplace where you really want to go. Okay. All right. Let's grab our break. When we come back, let's talk about, is it self-righteous to point out sins that people are committing? Okay. 877-381-4567. Don't go anywhere. We're back right after this. These guys are doing all of the talking. We need to hear from you. Call in now. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. This is Greg Gwynn with this week's bullet point. We're aware of your plans to leave this local church. What's that you say? You didn't know that you had such plans? Yes, in fact, such plans are in place for all of us in every congregation. There are several ways it might happen. You might decide to move to some other location, or you could elect to become a member of some other area congregation. Or, although we pray it would never happen, you might become unfaithful and fall away. If none of those scenarios develop, you will leave this church at the time of your death. Do you see what we mean? Every one of us, at some point, will be leaving the local congregation. So then the question is not if, rather it is when. And when you leave, we wonder how folks will react to your departure. There are three possibilities. First, sadness. When good, faithful, active, involved, dedicated members leave our midst, we are truly sad to see them go. Every congregation depends on members of this sort. They are the ones who step up to teach classes, call on the sick, encourage the weak, enthusiastically support the programs of work, and generally do all they can to see to it that the local church succeeds. They constitute the real backbone of a local congregation. When such people leave, there's a sort of void that is left behind. Usually it takes a good while to get over their departure. We really miss them. But then again, secondly, when some folks leave, their leaving is hardly noticed. Unfortunately, there are some folks that never really get involved in the local church. Oh yes, they may attend with some regularity, but they seldom do anything more than that. Don't expect these people to get involved in anything that requires extra effort. They simply won't do it. Sadly, when they leave the church, their absence is barely noticed by the other members. And finally, third, when some folks leave, there's a sense of relief, almost happiness. It's a truly horrible reality, but in most churches, there are members who do nothing but complain and criticize. They don't do anything themselves, but they're always looking to disparage what others are doing. Read Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. They are constantly tearing down rather than building up their fellow Christians. When they are gone, folks almost breathe a sigh of relief. That is really sad. So, you are ultimately going to leave the local church that you're a member of. How will your brethren react to your leaving? That's this week's bullet point. Think about it. Hi, my name is Jack. I am 8 years old, and this is Vulture Bible Study. We're waiting to hear from you. Call in right now and join in on the virtual Bible study. Now, back to the program. Back on the program tonight. Remind you, this program is brought to you by the College of Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. Find out more about us by visiting our website, thevirtualbiblestudy.com, or give us a call at any time, questions at collegeu.com. You can email us at questions at collegeu.com. You can't call us here. You can call us at 877-381-4567. We'd love to talk with you or study with you if you have any question 
or concern you'd like to talk with us questions at collegeu.com is or 877-381-4567 or the way you you can contact us we're talking about righteousness on the program tonight and right now we're talking about the, the unfortunate accusation that sometimes leveled you're being self-righteous yeah well it is possible to be self-righteous and we're going to talk about that here in a minute but it is not in other words, when we say God has a, speci a specific way that he wants us to serve him, there's a right way and a wrong way to serve God. We're not being self-righteous when we say that. No. And, and make sure it's understood, as we were saying, we're not claiming that we're perfect in application, but we're saying there is a perfect way. And we're saying we all need to be striving for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, 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 but some people have just basically, as you were saying, Jacob, taken the view, well, it doesn't matter. You don't even have to try for anything. Yeah. Uh, f there's another big way that people claim we're being self-righteous, and that is if, if we speak out about sin. If we, seek, if we speak out about homosexuality, for instance, if we speak out about the, the errors of marriage, divorce, remarriage, unlawful divorce and remarriage, uh, people say, oh, you're just being self-righteous. Or if we talk about modesty, uh, this last Sunday evening here at College View, you can get, actually, you can get on our uh, YouTube page and see a sermon there about modesty that was preached here last yep. Sunday evening. Uh, people are going to say, "Oh, you're just being self-righteous. You, you, if you if you teach that, or if you condemn this or that sort of clothing, you're just being self-righteous." If we talk about drinking alcohol you know, and, and condemn the consumption of alcohol, intoxicating beverages, you're just being self-righteous. Even if we just if, if we talk about something like kids dancing, going to the prom, ah, oh, well, you're just being self righteous. I tell you, it is not it is not self righteousness when we say these things are condemned in the Word of God. These things are wrong. This is sin. We cannot engage in these activities. We're not being self righteous when we do that. God's faithful people have always identified sin and called it out. Uh, I, I was, noticing some verses in Psalm 119, and there's, of course, all of those talk about God's Word, all, all the verses, all, uh, maybe one or two exceptions, but almost every verse in that very long psalm talk about God's Word. Psalm 119, beginning verse 53, horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law. 136, rivers of waters run down my eyes because they keep not thy law. 158, I beheld the transgressors and was grieved because they kept not thy word. Notice, here's a guy, he, he, he was, the, the, the psalmist was saying, I'm grieving because they're not keeping your, well, he shouldn't oh, be, yeah, he shouldn't even be judging them. Why is he judging? He's being self-righteous. Yeah. No, that's what God's faithful have always done. Yeah. In 2 Peter 2, uh, verse 7, beginning, God delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Lot was in Sodom. There was sin all around him. Did he just say, well, I can't say anything about it. Uh, I'd be, I'd be, be acting self-righteous if I condemned what these people are doing. No, he was vexed day by day with the unlawful deeds of the people around him. He was called a righteous man, and the wickedness that was around him vexed him, it says, he was clearly denoting and, and, and recognizing the sins of the people around him. Our job, of course, Ephesians 5, verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But what? But rather reprove them. Don't engage in them. But it's not enough to just say don't engage. Okay, so I, I'm not going to engage in homosexuality, but I'm not going to speak out against it either because I don't want to be viewed as self-righteous. That's not what that verse says. Don't do it. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Don't do it. But rather reprove them. I'm supposed to speak out against them. Yep. Dwight's in Iowa t tonight and says quite the opposite. We would not be righteous if we allow others to lead a sinful life. Although we have to look at the log in our eye before we help others, we are still obligated to help our brothers and sisters. Now, Dwight makes an excellent point. Dwight references that famous uh, instruction from Christ in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, beginning, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, 
but considereth not the beam that is in thy own eye. Or wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. And notice what he goes on to say. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast the mote out of no, thy brother's eye. No, then, then you'll be able to just keep your mouth shut and not say anything about anybody else. Yeah. No, that's it, not what it says. That's not what it says. Right. No, it, Jesus said, you, now, don't, don't be having this big glaring sin in your life that you're not taking care of, but take care of your sins, and then you can help your other your brother with the sins that they may have in their life. Exactly right. Thanks, Dwight. Uh, Kent in Georgia says that it is not self-righteousness to speak out against sin. He references 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So he said, he, he assigned Timothy the job of pointing out sin. And in Titus 1, verse 9, Hold fast the faithful word. Uh, he's talking about elders who, who are holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. So their mouths must be stopped, he said. It's not wrong to point out sin. We're not being self-righteous when we do that. And Daniel references the passage you referenced earlier, Matthew, Ephesians 5 verses 11 through 13. He says, when done properly is not self-righteous to be uh, but is what co is commanded. It's not self-righteousness to say someone is not living right, but it's commanded. He references Ephesians 5, 11 through 13, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them, for it is a shame to even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret but all things that are reproved are meta made manifest by the light for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. And so he says, again, like you mentioned, we need to be reproving those evil deeds as we see them. All right. Now, so we, we talked about what self-righteousness is not. Let's talk about what self-righteousness is. Kent says self-righteousness is pseudo-righteousness based on a false plan in opposition to God's revealed system of righteousness, Romans 10, verses 1 through 3. I think that's exactly right. Self-righteousness is rejecting God's instructions concerning what is right and substituting your own rules. Now, Kent referenced Romans 10, beginning verse 1, and here it is. Notice what Paul said about his Jewish brethren. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. We, we've pointed out many times that that statement indicates that they, at that point in time, were not saved. My heart's desire for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. So they were ignorant of God's righteousness. They had not submitted themselves to God's righteousness. But what they had done was they went about to establish their own righteousness, uh -huh. their own system of righteousness. Yeah. Uh, and so when, when we reject God's will, when we reject his plan, when we say it's not important to follow his truth, I think we can do it this way. The Bible may say that, but I don't think that's really all that important. I think it's okay to do it this way. That is actually establishing my own system of righteousness. That is biblical self-righteousness. Okay. Now, an, an, another way this is done is maybe not so uh, overtly and intentionally, but as these were, they were ignorant of God's righteousness. So if I just don't study and I just go through life trying to make my own way and come up with my own plan for what I think is right and what's wrong, I just I'm just going to look at things, and people are blatant enough to say this. I just evaluate things, and I decide, is that good or is that bad? And if it's bad, I stay away from it. If it's good, I do it. I'm ignorant of God's righteousness. I just go about to establish my own. Yeah. And uh, that, that's happening in the world all around us. Exactly right. Okay. So now what we're trying to do now is get a real picture of what self-righteousness actually is. Okay. Uh, Another element of self-righteousness is trusting in my own ability to do it right, perfectly, to, to trust in my own meritorious works. 
other words, I'm so good, and I have done so much and done so well that God owes me salvation. Right. Jesus described uh, uh, that sort of person in Luke 18, beginning verse 9. He spake this parable to certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Notice, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and they despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. That, that Pharisee bragged about what he had done as though he, God should be praising him rather than him praising God. He was just showing, holding it up here for God. God, yeah. look at this. So and it's been pointed out so often in that prayer, he never asked for anything, didn't think he needed anything. Yeah. So he was trusting in his own self-righteous, meritorious works, which was a big mistake. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, the prophet said, We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. This is how we should probably view ourselves. Our, anything that we do is just like filthy rags before God. We, we do not deserve, we do not merit, we have not earned to be right with God. He's made it possible, but it's not based upon our own merit. Okay. All right. Um, so we've talked about what it is not, what it is. Daniel in Jennings, Florida says to be self-righteous is to be righteous in one uh, one's own eyes. This goes back to the first point you made. He references Judges 21, verse 25. There was no king in those days in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Um, and that's that mirrors what you referenced there in Romans ten one through three, where we're just going about to determine what's right in our in our own opinion. Yeah, let's right. take our last break. When we come back, let's let's look at some a, a a classic example in the scriptures, the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Oh, and uh, okay, let's talk about that. And when we get back, we'll take your thoughts. Don't go anywhere. The verse of Bible study continues right after this. Warning, this is to make you aware of a disorder plaguing American and the metro area, BDD, Bible Deficit Disorder. Many people are not getting enough Bible in their daily lives. Are you? Answer the following questions to see if you might be suffering from BDD. Do you answer spiritual questions by saying, I think, instead of the Bible says? Do you depend on religious authors and pastors to tell you what to believe? When Benny Hinn says, this is your day for a miracle, do you believe him? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then you might be suffering from BDD, Bible Deficit Disorder. The College View Church of Christ is dedicated to fighting BDD by teaching the Bible. We focus on Christ by following His Word. Don't succumb to BDD, Bible Deficit Disorder. Fight it by joining us for Bible study on Sunday at 9.30 a.m. and Wednesday at 7 p.m. As long as there is breath in your body, it is not too late to fight Bible Deficit Disorder. We'll see you this Sunday at the College View Church of Christ. We're tracking the trends on the virtual Bible study. Most American churches have 80 or fewer worshipers each week, and fewer than 45% of churches have grown more than 2% in the last five years. Fighting churches are not growing churches. Serious conflict stunts growth. For churches that maintained relative calm, that is, no serious conflict in the past five years, more than half of them grew. Only 29% of churches with serious conflict did the same. That information is via Pew Research Center. The Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are ye not carnal and walk as men? And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Colossians three seventeen. Now, back to the program. We're back on the program tonight as we talk about righteousness. We're talking about self-righteousness what it was, what it, is, what it is, what it is not. And now to a famous statement by Jesus in Matthew 5, verse 20. In Matthew 5, 20, Jesus said, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ooh. So think about that. That statement also, like we were saying earlier, that's a statement that indicates they were not in a saved 
situation. They weren't right. You're going to have to do better than they do, they're doing, or you will not go so to heaven. So there's a line there that you've got to exceed. Yeah. Yeah, so this is sort of like a this is setting an unacceptable low barrier. You got to get you're going to have to get past this because if you're not if you're not doing better than they were doing, you're not going to make it to heaven. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's ironic because another accusation that goes along with this idea of being self righteous when you're trying to if you're, you're trying to strive for obedience and compliance with God's law, you're trying to encourage others to comply with God's law, they'll say you're self-righteous, and they'll also say you're being a Pharisee. As you, try, a Pharisee. As, you try to, you, as you strive for righteousness, well, you're just, being a, you're just a Pharisee. Yeah. Well, Jesus said you got to do better than the Pharisees, so you gotta, you got to strive for righteousness. They're not there yet. Yeah. Now, usually what people mean by that is they mean, well, you're being legalistic like the Pharisees were. The Pharisees were just strict legalists, and obviously Jesus did not agree with their legalism. Well, I think as Kent mentioned in his answer, um, the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, Kent said, was not strict obedience to the Mosaic covenant under which they lived. The self-righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees was the elevation of their uninspired man-made customs and traditions over the law of God. And I think he's right. Now, so... Their rights, they, as we were saying earlier, they were self-righteous and they, they were ignoring the, the rules of God and trying to establish their own methods of righteousness. That, that doesn't work. But I want to tell you something about the scribes and Pharisees. When they insisted that people keep the law of Moses perfectly, they were not wrong. Uh, in, in Matthew 23, Jesus said, verse 2, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat all therefore they bid you observe that, observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not, for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries, they enlarge the borders of their garments, they love the uppermost rooms of the feast and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets to be called of men, Rabbi and uh, Rabbi, Rabbi. So Jesus said, when they tell you what the law of Moses says, you do it. But don't imitate them because they're telling you to do it and they're not doing it themselves. But then I think a really interesting, and, and, and that whole chapter, he goes on and says over and over again, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He just says that over and over again through, through chapter 23 of Matthew. But notice verse 23, Matthew 23, 23. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Now think about that for a minute. So that we understand in the law of Moses that you had to give 10% of whatever you gained. And so if you were a farmer and, and you gained 100 bushels of wheat, you had to give 10 bushels of wheat. You gave a tithe. You gave 10%. These scribes and Pharisees were so meticulous about keeping that tithing rule that when they grew their garden herbs, that's what mint and anise and cumin, that's what they are. Th those are garden herbs. A whole year's crop of those garden herbs might be a handful. But you don't need much spices when you're... But they would divide that up, and give a tenth. That's pretty legalistic, pretty legalistic. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you've paid tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done. But notice, and not to leave the other undone. He didn't say, you're just being legalist when you insist on paying tithes of your garden herbs. Forget that. That's crazy. That's silly. You don't have to, you don't have to be that careful about keeping the law. He didn't say that. He said, you ought, you, ought to, you ought to work on the weightier matters of law, judgment, mercy, and faith. But you should not leave the other things undone. Yeah. So, Jesus, so their problem was not, not when they, ins they, they, they were wrong when they established their own rules and insisted that men keep them, but they were not wrong when they insisted that men keep the law of Moses and expected them to do so carefully. That, so that sort of legalism was not their problem. All right. Uh, 877-381-457, if you'd like to comment tonight. The chat room's awful quiet if you'd like to send a comment in there. What about this righteousness of the Pharisees? Why were they lost? Why did Jesus say you got to do better than them? 
Well, it wasn't legalism, or, you know, that word doesn't even appear in the Bible, and it gets thrown around so much you'd think it's in every other page. Yeah. Uh, but the idea that you have to obey God's law, uh, it wasn't that. It wasn't because they were telling people you need to obey God's law. In fact, Jesus said you need to do as they tell you to do. Yeah. So there yeah. goes that. Exactly right. Okay. Their big problem was, as we were just reading there in Matthew 23, verses 3 and 4, they say and do not. So the righteousness of the Pharisees was to say, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, and then they wouldn't do it themselves. Yeah. That's, a, that's a bad kind of righteousness. Yeah, you need to be, uh, you need to be watching that temper of yours, and then I'm going to go fly off a handle. Yeah, yeah. You need to be watching that foul language, but I, I, I don't. Yeah. Or you, need to, you need to be doing this, and then I just live any way I want, or I'm just trying to, I'm trying to make you comply, but I'm not interested in complying. There's very few things that are as distasteful as people who don't, as we often say, practice what they preach. And that was the problem with the Pharisees. They didn't practice what they preached. So you've preached. got to do better than that. You've got to do better than telling other people what they need to do, and then you're not doing it yourself, okay? Yeah. And then in that same context that we were just reading, another thing that was wrong with their righteousness was they were doing what they were doing to be seen of men. Notice Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 5, all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. It's interesting. Uh, do a little study there on phylacteries and borders of garments. Those were things that the law of Moses taught that should be done. Yeah, they needed them. Uh, you know, the, the phylacteries were like headbands that they wore, and there were, there were scripture references inscribed on the headband. The borders of their garments, uh, there was a fringe on their garments, and when people saw that, it reminded them that they were the people of God. Mm-hmm. Well, the Pharisees weren't content with a simple headband or a, a, a conventional fringe on their garment. They wanted to look super religious. And so we're told that they would actually, on their headbands, they would have a headband with a box uh, mounted on the front of it, and they would write out scriptures and stuff them in that box. So they, could have, they didn't just have a headband. They had a headband with a whole bunch they of scriptures. They had a whole box full of them. Yeah. Mm. And then they make the, the, the fringes uh, on their garments bigger so they look more righteous yeah and so it was it was it was a, a display religion a show. When a everybody show. see it yeah and jesus of course famously talked about doing our works to be seen of men in the sermon on the mount uh in, in matthew chapter six he said verse one take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them otherwise you have your reward have no reward of your father which is heaven Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they might have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. He went on to talk about praying, making loud public prayers, re repetitive public prayers, and so forth. So Jesus was, was very condemning of a sort of righteousness, which is, I'm trying to make it a display of it, right. show everybody else how religious I am. And that was, that was part of what was wrong uh, with the, the Pharisees and, and their righteousness. I think is you, you really, you, you got to study that whole chapter 23 of Matthew. And Jesus keeps spelling out things that he, that, that he saw that were wrong with the Pharisees. In 14 of 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, Ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, ye shall receive the greater damnation. That that devouring widows' houses, they were taking advantage of of people who could least afford it. They would they would require gifts, take money from the ones who were least able to afford it. That sounds sort of like some of the religious charlatans in our day and time too oh man yeah uh, but they they serve for gain but but uh, you know they they were doing what they were doing to get rich from doing it you know how i might be guilty of that i might be guilty of that if i adhere to the health and wealth gospel of joel olstein for instance that if you if you if if you are right god will will overflowingly bless you and so the reason i'm doing what i'm doing is because i want to get overflowing blessings from god i want to be rich I want to have big cars, nice houses. No, serving for gain, that was the, the righteousness of yep, the Pharisees. Yep, yep. A lot of people are motivated by that. It's sad, but, uh, it, and, and it's, so it's a, it's a time, an age-long problem, right? Yeah. That uh, the Pharisees were doing it like people are today. That, uh, I'll serve God, and hopefully I can get something out of this. Exactly.
They didn't, they didn't keep their word. They didn't, they didn't honor their oaths. Jesus talked about that in Matthew 23, 16 through 22. We won't take time to read that. They just didn't keep their word. They were not, they were not honest. They didn't do what they said they would do. They showed no mercy, verse 23. Yeah. And then just sort of the catch-all expression about them is that they were hypocrites. Over and over again, Jesus called them hypocrites. Uh, really uh, uh, sort of very graphic description of the Pharisees. Verse 26 of Matthew 23. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. I mean, he said the previous verse, you may clean the outside of the cup and platter, but within they are full of extortion. He said they were like dirty dishes. They made the outside look clean inside. They were corrupt. And then he said, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Uh, the practice of the Jews was that they would whitewash sepulchers so people wouldn't accidentally go in them because if you went into where dead men's bones were, you became unclean and had to go through rites of purification. And so you, you might have to go in there if you're burying another dead person, but you wouldn't want to go in there accidentally. And so for that reason, they, they whitewashed the sepulchers sort of to mark them, to keep people from accidentally entering. And, and so Jesus said, you, you Pharisees are like whited sepulchers. You look nice on the outside. You've been whitewashed. But inside, you're corrupt and full of dead men's bones. And so they, they were just hypocrites. They, their hearts were not genuine and sincere. Uh, they were not doing the will of God. They're, and in and all, and all of that, Jesus said, your righteousness is going to have to be better than that. Or you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Daniel is in Florida, and he's in the chat room tonight. He said uh, those, uh, they approved of those who killed the prophets by building the tombs of their fathers, Luke 11, 8, 48, and doing likewise, Luke 11, 49 through 51. We do not want to be like that. And he said in an email today, uh, their righteousness was lacking. They needed more than they had, Romans 3.23, namely submitting to the righteousness of God, Romans 10, verses 3 and, th and 4. Thank you, Daniel. And then Kent said the righteous... Yeah, I read, I read, read that. You read all that. Yeah, you got yeah, all that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Good. Sorry. All right. all right. Good. And we're just out of time. So it worked out. It worked out great. Uh, good discussion. I, uh, Kyle, how about you? Anything from that side tonight? Uh, which, uh, we're supposed to thirst for righteousness. We had to make sure it's the right oh, God's righteousness. Oh, thirst for righteousness. God's there righteousness. You go. exactly good right. one to bring God in there. Yeah, good yeah. point. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. I think that's verse 8, Matthew 5, and it's one of the Beatitudes. It's not, it's not verse 8, I don't believe. Verse 6. Verse, verse 6. six. Yeah, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. They yeah. shall be filled. Well, right. we, need to, we need to crave to be right with God. And All that's right. what righteousness is. All right. Good discussion tonight, Dad. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you for listening. And we're glad, hope you benefited from our discussion of God's Word tonight and hope you make plans to be back here this time next week for another edition of the Virtual Bible Study. In the meantime, we encourage you to put God first in your life, study His inspired Word of the Bible, and live by it every day. You'll never regret it. Thanks for listening to the Virtual Bible Study, brought to you by the College View Church of Christ. The College View Church of Christ meets at 1618 Hampshire Pike in Columbia, Tennessee. If you are in the Columbia, Tennessee area, we encourage you to worship with the College View Church of Christ on Sunday mornings at 930 and on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. The College View Church of Christ also welcomes you to attend their Wednesday night Bible studies at 7 o'clock. If you have any questions about something that was said on tonight's broadcast or would like more information about the College College View Church of Christ, please call 931-381-4567. That number again, 931-381-4567. Or for more information on the internet, visit collegeview.com. Be sure to tune into the virtual Bible study this time next Thursday for another informative study of God's Word.